Hello, and welcome to More Than Music. I'm Ronan Brown, and this is my special guest, Mr. Stephen Cooney. Yay! And we're both completely out of tune. Because we were fine here earlier, it was freezing cold, and then all you people came in and started breathing. But tuning is just tuning. I might uh, check my tuning too. There'll be plenty of tuning. Plenty of tuning. They were in tune when I bought them. Gorgeous. Will they stay in tune? So, it's always hard to know how to start something like this, but, but uh, I don't remember when I first met Steve. It was in the 80s. I sort of have to go back and think about, I was born in 1965, so in 1985 I was 20. So I was younger than, it was the early 80s, very early 80s. I don't know if you remember Steve, but it was the time of the onion field. Anyone remember the onion field? No. It was a great uh, late night. Don't forget your microphone there. It was a great late night establishment. In the Ranala village, which was very cool at the time. I don't know if Ranala is still cool or is it That's very fairly cool, yeah. Ranala was cool. And uh, there was a, a man called Jerry who set up a late night cafe where all sorts of shenanigans went on after people got out of the pubs. I suppose a wine bar is what it would have That's been. What it was, yeah, before wine bars existed. And the musicians would gather there after their various gigs. And uh, it just built up through word of mouth and it was a kind of a happening place. I remember one night the, the water boys came trooping through. The water boys were here. It became very cool and Adam Clayton came. And it was a very cool place. And then I remember one night some lad got thrown through the plate glass window of the front. I think they put a bit of a dampener on it. I wasn't there that night. <laughs> but I, I can hope. tell you lots of shenanigans and strange queer things went on in the, at the back. But you know, I wouldn't know anything about that. And it just I got me heard. thinking, you heard about it. Do you remember the Manhattan? Yeah. The Manhattan has just been knocked down. Oh. Do anyone remember the Manhattan, yeah? Yeah, yeah? I don't even know what the name of the road was, but it was what on the other side of the junction was South Circular Road, and around right. the corner is Camden Street. I, I love the story about the man who just waited outside the Manhattan, and <laughs> keeping an eye inside. Somebody ordered a big steak, and the steak was put down, the man opened it and dashed it, <laughs> grabbed the steak and ran for his life. So it was kind of that kind of a place. But how did he do it? Huh? Just remember, the windows were up so high. He must have been very tall. What was the name of the woman who ran the place? She oh. had a, a big reputation for... Huh? Bernie. Bernie. No. God, you were there. You dined there, so... Bernie Higgins. Bernie Higgins. Reggie. Reggie. Oh my God. I don't remember Reggie, but I was very young. I remember dear old Dublin <laughs> in the red... Reggie Tyler. Uh, what were you doing around those days in Dublin? You hadn't gone Stockton swinging yet. No, uh, no, it's just oh, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Just trying to stay alive, busking, busking on uh, Grafton Street, Stephen's Green Corner. Busking. There, there was the Dandelion Market, which is gone. That was still there. Yeah, that's I, it. I was thrown out of the Dandelion Market for busking on the Didgeridoo. I mean, they didn't mind you two playing there, but they weren't impressed with the didgeridoo. However, the poet Paula Meehan was there when I was my short didgeridoo busking career there. And she wrote a poem in one of her books about the didgeridoo player on Grafton Street. So that became immortalised by the great Paula Meehan. Uh, busking, busking, Ronan, yeah. And you said earlier, on the when you, when you travelled from Australia, you didn't bring a huge amount of instruments with you? No, I had just brought a mandolin because it was hap small for travelling. And I suppose I must have had an inflated ego because I imagined I would be able to get enough work 
with my mandolin to buy a guitar, which was my trade. So I'll, I'll make enough, get enough gigs, because I didn't get any gigs at all. Um, busked until the snows came down, and I, I'd never really seen snow. I, I don't think I grew up in Australia, so snow was not a, a regular occurrence. It would ne you'd never snowed where I lived anyway. Where, where in Australia did you live? Melbourne, Melbourne, down south. Nice. The, we consider ourselves the civilized part of Australia because we weren't a convict colony like Sydney uh, or Tasmania, Van Diemen's Land. So. Uh, so I couldn't get a gig. Guitar players had the scene kind of sewn up anyway. So I sent home to Australia for my bass guitar because I saw there were no bass players here. Well, there were bass players in rock bands, but in trad, I was here to learn trad. And there were no bass players in the trad scene as far as I could see. There were some in the ballad groups, but in the traditional music scene, it was only Kieran Brennan in Clowned was the only bass player I could see. So I saw, I saw uh, an opportunity in the market presented itself. <laughs> so I sent home to the mammy for the bass. And was that the, the stick bass, the sideways stick bass, or was it something else? No, I, I, got that, I got that a couple of years later. It was a beautiful handmade fretless bass. It was the first fretless bass. So it weighed a ton. Yeah, to be it over. I think Moving Hearts borrowed it to, for their record. Bwah, 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 bwah. Oh, it was fretless. Yeah, I love the fretless bass. So uh, I, uh, I got a job, I, I, I got a gig. The first gig I got, I, was, I had a beautiful old Gibson mandolin and I was busking on the S Stevens Green, Gar uh, Grafton Street corner and a man who I now know to be Neil Toner came along and said, oh, do you play bluegrass? Uh, so of course you have to lie and say, yeah, I play bluegrass. And he said, okay, you can play with the Sackville String Band tonight in the Thomas House in Thomas Street. Because it's all memory lane tonight, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, it, that's, I suppose, the thing is, it was a tenor. I remember I was a guest of the Sackville String Band playing bluegrass with them. And there's plenty of bluegrass in Australia, so I knew my way around a bit. So that was my first gig. And another lad who was a guest on the same night um, was his first gig ever in Ireland was Frankie Lane. Frankie Lane to countryside. So we both were initiated into the Dublin gigging scene the same night with the Sackville String Band, Thomas House, Thomas Street. So that was nice. That was my first gig. But y you have to have more than that. So uh, a man who was at that gig, Owen O'Toole was his name, and he ran a fish farm in Wicklow. And he offered me, a, he offered me labouring work on his fish farm for 50 quid a week, and so 50 quid was good money in those days. And uh, so I worked that winter on Owen's fish farm. He was breeding trout and salmon in a little place in the Wicklow Hills. Uh, that was fantastic. And so I would work on the fish farm during the day and practice fretless bass at night, learning Irish music learning the tunes, listening to the Cayley bands, like, because the Cayley band piano players, boom, ching, 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 boom. Even though it's conservative, it maps out the harmonic plan of the tunes. And whether you, whether it's, if it's square or right, it is square by definition, but that's what I needed. I needed to know squarely what are the chord changes in this tune. And that taught me the repertoire of tunes and what the harmonic plan was of the tunes. So I'd be listening to that and then playing along and trying to put more of a groove into it. And then I would, uh, <coughs> weekends I'd go to Dublin and uh, my friend Louis McManus in Australia had given me the names mm. of the meeting place, Dorset Street and Slatteries of Capel Street were the two places I knew. So I'd go to the meeting place and with the didgeridoo, I'd say, uh, good day, I'm from Australia and this is a didgeridoo. You want a jam, mate? And that was my calling, that was my modus operandi to try and... I'd say that went down like a lead balloon. I, I don't time. know, I don't know. It depended who you got. There was one very nice yeah. group, uh, name just escaping me at this very minute, at playing at the meeting place. Uh, I'll try and remember before the end of the night, but uh, they, they, they let me play with them, a funk group. And another night it was Stockton Swing, who I didn't know. And then uh, I 
got up and played with them. They liked it. Then they asked me to join the group. So that was good. So then I had a job with Stock and Swing, also 50 quid a week for uh, six days on the road. Uh, so you didn't do the fish farm anymore? So yeah, you just swapped just, uh, yeah. one dirty job for another. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I loved Stock and Swing mainly because I got to see Ireland because we were on the road all the time and I'd be there with my folklore and I'm kind of, you know, you know looking up the names of the towns, going through Sligo, Drumsna, Drumsna, Drimsnov, Drimsnov, Swimming Ridge, oh, right. And it's the whole touring, that was my main preoccupation was looking out the window of the towns yeah. and the Irish and Balasa de Balia, Bel Asadara, the waterfall of the oak tree, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, so it began to percolate through the skull. And How lucky it was, you were to be doing that and loving it. You know, you could have uh, yeah, just spent it. all day in bed, but you were, well, you did do that too. <laughs> no, so we were out on the road, and then, of course, you're learning tunes from these experts, yeah. and they were experts, there's no doubt about that. There were uh, the three boys in Stoke, it was four, I suppose, Kieran Hanrahan, Paul Roach, Morris Lennon, those three, anyway, uh, met at a... At a flower. At a flower winner's concert. They had all won their respective oh, yeah. instrumental competitions. They met at a winner's concert, and so they put the group together. And Tommy Hayes, yeah, he was there. He was a flower winner as well, so those four. Kieran's brother, Mikey. And I was the bass player. Now, having said that, the bass, you know, I, Ronan, Irish music is very hierarchical. I don't know, have you noticed that... I hear tales. I'm not sure you would know because you... The I got the very... Up yeah, you you at the top. No, well, no, you, no, but it's true. I know exactly you, what you're talking about. You're not necessarily that top. You were equal top with the harp. Yeah. It's, it's a kind of, it's a toss up. You could argue the case for both, but nonetheless, the Ellen pipes. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah. Are, and they're if not the top strata, the the equal first strata. Well, we deserve to be top, even if we're not. And then you got the fiddle, and you flute, maybe flute fiddle, tin whistle. Concertina. Accordion. No, accordion is below the concertina. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, I agree. No, I'm not talking about what Button I accordion, do. then below that you've got piano accordion. Uh, what's next on the list? Banjo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Banjo. Yes. Okay, we're into the plucked strings now at this stage. Yes. Uh, <laughs> banjo, yeah, very good. Mandolin, equivalent with banjo probably. And uh, bazooki. Why is the bazooki above the guitar? I don't know. It possibly because... Because it's not a guitar. <laughs> well, That's see, the reason. There was this amazing time, the 70s, when the, when the bazooki came in. Uh, Donald Lanny, Andy Irvine and Alec Finn. So you got and Planks, Johnny Moynihan. Johnny Moynihan bring it in. But particularly the impact of <coughs> Planksty and Alec Finn and the Dunnan. Two totally different approaches. Which, can I just, I know I'm not supposed to be rambling on, but can hey, I do... We're covering the whole of but, Irish music here in, but, in one five-minute spell. But what I wanted to diverge on was, I, I, the reason I came to Ireland was very clear. I had been living with the Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory, and I'd gone through initiation there, and, um, uh, and then they said, I keep saying this story, but it's true, you know, how, mm. how do you expect to understand our culture? You don't even understand your own culture. Go back to the land of your ancestors and learn these things that they told me to learn. So it was a directive from the Aboriginal elders to come here. But at the same time, one of my students in Melbourne brought me a tape of uh, Planksty's Blacksmith. And how, how I was teaching in those days was teaching guitar mandolin. Uh, somebody would bring me... The lesson would be about two and a half hours and... Someone would bring me a, a cassette tape of a, a track they wanted to learn. I'd listen to it, I'd work it out, work out how it was done, write it out and teach them to do it in the course of one lesson. That was always my modus operandi and that was what I could do. But it was always a challenge, but I c could always do it. And what sort of things were you teaching? What, what well, Whatever music? they wanted, whatever the students Mostly thought. modern, popular music. Modern pop music, mainly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I'm sure it was. And but anyway, this Paul Creasy, the student, came and put this track on. And I said, what the hell is this? Well, listen, Paul, I'm a bit busy today, so leave it with me and I'll get back to you next week. And I said, what the hell is that? It was the most amazing sound I'd ever heard. It was terrifying. And I couldn't work it out at all. And it was the first time I was defeated in terms of being able to instantly analyze because you know that's what one's ego is primed to do i just couldn't do it and i remember i remember the moment and taking it into another room. what the hell is that and listening to it over and over and um, so it was absolutely fantastic and then the next week he brought me a track from to Dannon's mist covered mountain and i said that is completely different from that they're totally different but they're both irish music and it was, that was a real kind of, I hate to use the word, light bulb moment, but it was because uh, whatever I had thought about Irish music, this Planksty was this amazing Irish music and this Chidanum was an incredible Irish music and they were both completely different from each other. And saying, well, if that is Irish music and that is Irish music, that means there must be a place for me somewhere in that world to do my own thing and it still become Irish music. So, I mean, that opened up the doors for me to but can I ask methodologically methodologically jeepers we haven't got now you've silenced me completely. okay good no the, I, I do the have hierarchy. a question I have a que no no forget the hierarchy for a second your fam remind us hierarchy your family were they aware of Irish music were they involved in any way in Irish music uh, did you have any experience at all well, my father was, uh, my father's family were Irish, my mother's family were first Scots, English, I suppose. But my, f but my father's father was very Catholic, Republican. And when my father married my mother, and she was a Protestant, it didn't go to well. So my, my grandfather disowned my father for marrying a Protestant. And my father father wasn't too impressed with that I remember he, he would ring up his dad to say oh, we've another we've another child born another soul lost to the church <laughs> was was all his father would say so uh, I was the last of five so I, I, I met my grandfather once he took me out to see him I just remember this old man I remember the red light of the uh, the sacred heart lamp I remember him looking at me but no interaction so my I don't know really what he thought. Uh, so there wasn't music being played? Uh, yeah, yeah. My dad always played guitar. My dad was a great guitar player. Okay. And, uh, he sang... Uh, he only sang a couple of Irish songs, but uh, one he did... We did sing, which probably isn't even Irish at all. Probably, you know, that whole school of uh, American Jewish songwriters in the... Uh, oh, that dear little town in the old county down. He always used to sing that one. Um, but he never talked so much about Ireland. It was more distant. You see, I think what he thought was, uh, am I allowed to swear on this channel or not? I cough just at the opportune <coughs> moment. It's so like <coughs> Ireland and anything Irish, I don't want to know about Ireland. Yeah. If that's what Ireland means, <laughs> yeah, well, that you can't common. acknowledge your own child or your grandchild. I don't want to know about it. In fact, and he, so he's now in Australia. He's saying Australia is an egalitarian society where everybody is equal and we all get on with each other and we, we leave the prejudices of the old world behind us. And so that was his attitude just to get on with everybody. So he never bought into the, yeah. uh, the nationalist. Well, his, his granny had run a safe house in Manchester, I know. Uh, and see how he, so he had all that side of uh, I mean, his his father's mother had run a, a safe house, so there was that whole right wing Republican Catholic Irish side on one side, and my <laughs> my mother then was the daughter of a, a Methodist minister, so he's from Scotland, his, so, but yeah, so it's Protestant, so that was like that split. Yeah. So uh, I mean, if, if you looked at it from a Freudian perspective, you could say that I came back to Ireland to rediscover what was lost in... I should have learned from my father. I should yeah. have learned from my grandfather where we came from, what the Townsend were, what the family history was. 
I should have learned all that, but that was denied because of uh, religious prejudice. But you did it yourself. It's great. Come here, remind me. Hierarchy. <laughs> Go okay. back to hierarchy. Rant. So, it's time for okay. a little rant. Well, we we haven't had a rant yet. No, we, we diverted because of bazooki. We'd reached the club yes. strings of bazooki. And we're heading rapidly towards Liam O'Flynn. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, surely. But uh, so the point I was making there a while back was that I'd heard Planksty's amazing blacksmith with the mandolin and bazooki of Donald and Andy. And then I'd heard Alec Finn's amazing Twinkle evasive yeah. bazooki, which could never be pinned down. And I said that to him, Alec, you, you're, you're the most elusive of all the accomplices. And he was delighted with that. <laughs> he was delighted to be called elusive because that's what he is. You can't work out what he's doing. Yeah. But Dan Annan could do that because they had... Ringo with booga chooka booga chooka booga chooka booga. So they didn't have to define the bass note. The bass note was never defined, and because Ringo's defining the bass sound, but there's no note involved, and and Alec is drifting above, not mm. in the stratosphere, but he's hinting at chords mm. without actually specifying them. So you hear, yeah, I'm hearing two entirely different versions of bazooki in Irish music. So that made me think there's another approach. So. We've reached the bazooki, and then below the bazooki was the guitar, and then the first guitarist to uh, uh, the first guitarist to be accepted, if we looked at Coltus, was Mark Kelly, who joined Altan. Mark was the first guitarist to be accepted. Uh, somebody was telling me yesterday that uh, 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 Paul Brady was there was, that was a, me. Who, yeah, <laughs> I knew that. you're probably the only person. Somebody you know. Somebody. Yeah. Yeah, who was it? it was, what was the story there? Go on. Yeah, I was, I don't know what age I was, maybe eight or ten years old. Yeah. And a concert going on in, in Coltus. They had just gone into Monkstown, so that might date it for people. If anyone can help one of the, they went into, into Monkstown. And the concert suddenly ground to an angry halt because next up on stage on the bill of fare was Paul Brady. The guitar. And there was, a, there was a war going on. So there was a lot of murmuring and disgruntlement. And a group of the hierarchy went out into, a, into an ante room. And the concert sat mute, chatting for maybe 20, 30 minutes as they trashed it out. Because I was so young, I think I blinked. And I, I can't remember what happened after that. I don't know what the re re resolution of it was. Yeah, we must, we must we'll have to ring Brady and ask. Brady said, what, what, what happened? Yeah, we're making interesting. But how quickly? What you, you would that have been? microphone there, young fella. What you would that have been, um, Ronan? Yeah. You, you, I know you were asking, but did anyone give you a, an, exactly. a year? Well, no, I'd, I'd say it was around seventy-five. Right. If I was born in sixty-five. Twenty-five. So fifty years ago, anyway. <sighs> so the guitar, well, and what is below the? Oh, piano. Piano. Piano is above. Above. above it's somewhere above, up above. Above higher, bazooki, yeah. yeah. Because there's a Kaylee, traditional Kaylee piano. But what is below the guitar? Bass guitar. It's not even there. <laughs> so I was playing stock with Stockton Swing playing bass guitar. So I was the lowest of the low. Because, uh, the, oh, the Baron is above the guitar, definitely. Baron is above the guitar. Everything's above the guitar. Yeah, so I mean, that's a bit weird. But isn't it wonderful now that it's about musicianship now and not the instrument you're playing? Yeah. It's about time. Well, I used to be kind of perplexed about one thing, Ronan, which when I was just here, I remember a session in Dublin, and it was, this was fairly general. You'd see the fiddle player flaking away and dripping sweat, and the guitar players, ting, 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 ting just be there but don't be heard and don't put it. I said, that's not right. I mean, it's all about energy and it should be an equal amount of effort by everybody. Why is he putting in 4% of the effort of that guy? I, think it just, I just thought it was really weird. Yeah. And yeah. to cut a long story short, that's why I fell in love with Kerry and polkas and slides because after years of being told, shh, shh, okay. We go down to Kerry and they, uh, oh. you know, no matter how hard I played, it was never hard enough for them uh, because they just, they wanted to go wild and they wanted a wild guitar. And that was fantastic for me because I could just let loose. 
without being told to shh. And you Come here, we're, we're jumping the gun here now. Yeah. We have nothing left to talk about. Shall get we, it all done. We'll get all we the talking done, and we'll just pay tune. Yeah, we'll pay tune now. Liam O'Flynn. And Planksty brings you to Liam. And also the statue outside, Seamus Ennis. As he, Liam was very close to Seamus. He was. And Seamus bequeathed his pipes to Liam. I uh, played for years with Liam in the Piper's Call band. He recorded his uh, Piper's Call record at my house in Kerry. And um, he was very good to me. And one of the best things he ever did for me was elevate me from the strumming boy in the background to playing the tunes like I remember we did Schlieff uh, Naman the tune okay you take the first round well it's actually a second round oh no it's the first round he told me to take the tune I just wasn't expecting that but that was the first time someone of his status had asked me to play the tune because normally oh the guitar player will strum away in the background so that was a big step for me because I'm very grateful to Liam for that and other things he did. But just, I hate to say, elevate me. It's the wrong way to put about it. But, no, but, but show faith in what's you. What's the opposite of elevate? He de-opposite of elevated you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, well, he recognised that guitar players uh, can play tunes as well yeah. as strum chords. So that was fantastic. So, uh, like, and he the way he tossed the tune around, like... Uh, he made it played one the first round of the tune and then I played the second and Sean Keane played the third round and then we all played together or he, uh, he played it after that but that made me feel like I was part of the melodic ensemble as opposed to the strummer at the bottom of the pack yeah. and there's a lot of pigeonholing goes on in life and that, that's what was being broken there was that pigeonhole yeah fantastic great man yeah yeah wonderful man Sorely missed. So the opening track of that is the humours of Killy Clatter. And? And there was another tune with it, but we're not going to play that. We're going to keep that for next time. Is this the so key we're playing? Will you, if I start on the drones, will you, will you play the okay. melody? Sure. We'll elevate the melody to meet you.
coming. You're running. Gorgeous. Thank you, Stephen. That was lovely. It's, it's a complete pleasure. I think the two of us haven't played together since, since, the, since the 1980s. Yeah. No. I'm just looking at our next piece that we have here, and maybe we should just talk about that and um, use it as an intro, because it's a very interesting part of what you have been doing, Steve, which is looking at the old manuscripts sure. taken from the Harpers. Sure, well, you've done a lot of work in that area yourself, playing with uh, Siobhan Armstrong and Roshino Safdie in that yeah. trio. Yeah. So you. You would have got a good grounding there from well, Siobhan. The one we're going to play now, we play it very differently. So it's, well, I, I it's like I'd driving left-handed and right-handed, trying to move. So I might, I might crash and fall well, off the stage. But. Well, I'm sure I took a few liberties with the manuscript. Well, what do you got in a manuscript that has to be a, open to interpretation? Absolutely. And some people might say, no, you have to play it exactly as it says. But if you play it exactly as it says on the manuscript, it's going to be very dry. Uh, yeah, could you imagine Bunting actually being capable of writing what they played? He couldn't have been. So he had to give a, a condensed version of it, a simplified version of it, so as to just get it down. Yeah, sure. I wouldn't... Uh, what key? We, we haven't even discussed the key. No. Uh, it could be, we better sort that out first, should we? Shall we, shall, shall we head off to the green room for half an hour? <laughs> uh. I'll show you this now. Um. We met. Great. As we met. That reminds me, did you ever go down to Liffey Lore? to Cullum and Joe Kennedy on Liffey Street, a junk shop. No. No. No, tell us about it now. Uh, those two lads, they, they came over to escape the, not the draft, because that's America, but they came over to escape conscription Yeah. during World War Two. Ah. Yeah, Cull Cullum came over first, and he, he was followed over by his brother Joe, who was a, 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 a cyclist. But Cullum, however he managed it, he was very dapper, always wore a three-piece suit. But uh, I think it was the same three-piece suit he got married in uh, that he died in. And his wife eventually kicked him out. She was a, a fashion designer on Dawson Street. And very successful. I don't know her name. I must find out. And they, they would, he would have parties. He would invite people back after the pub. So she'd be trying to run her business and there'd be a rip-roaring party with Seamus Ennis and Tom Mulligan and all these Willie Clancy, whoever was around, would end up upstairs above the shop in Dawson Street. When I met him, I was in my early teens and him and Joe had this little junk shop in Liffey Street and uh, I was dead mad for playing a flute and he had a flute in the window and I went in to try the flute of course I couldn't play it but we became firm and fast friends especially when he found out that my grandmother was Delia Murphy and he was mad into Delia so we we had a great old time but I, he would always say ah, as we met as we met as we met that was his, his phrase always. Mm -hmm. so anyway back to Sheila Sheila Nikonlin yeah, anything to say about that? Written by, the history books would say, by Thomas Connellan, although uh, I don't believe he was called Connellan, I believe he was called Conlan. Conlan, yeah. And Siobhan thinks similar, which is good. Uh, he wrote some great tunes, wrote uh, very many great tunes. He was from Clun the Mahan in South Sligo. Uh, and this is one of his, uh, one of his nicest tunes, I think. And it must, Sheila must be related to him, a daughter. You'd think so, you'd think yeah. so. It's a beautiful, tender we piece. Don't know. Yeah, he, he was born about 1645, so we assume it's written in 1690-ish. But we don't know. It's, a, it's over 400 anyway. 
how did you can you read music your dati dati wati dati music uh, you know it's a it's kind of so topic I, I I find it hard but I can't uh, well yeah. uh, classical music I couldn't but Irish music tends to be written in D or G which is handy one sharp or two but the stuff of you find the Petrie collection is like five flats and things like that and uh, Do you know why that was? Uh, huh? Because they were recording, they were writing them down from as, the flat pitch pipes. Ex as uh, exactly what they were. And what the singers, what key the singers, the, yeah. the singer was singing. So, but uh, like the Goodman collection is easy enough to read. And of course with reels and jigs it's like doka 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 doka. So the timing is fairly straightforward. But I'm not good at reading music. So no. when you were looking at these old... Manuscripts. Did you have anyone to hold your hand? No, because I acquainted myself with recordings first, and then I looked at the manuscripts after mm. I'd. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, my prime informant was a woman, great harper Kathleen Lochnan, uh, uh, from Tipperary, and uh, lives in Galway. She she made a great study of the Conlon brothers. Um, that would be where I first heard that tune. So. Then I would hunt down different people. So, well, what do they think it is, and what do they think it is, and listen to what different people. And then I went to the museum in Belfast to look at the manuscripts, yeah, yeah, buntings, and then from all those things, you you sift and you say, well, I agree with, I like that, I don't really like that, and I take the best bits. Uh, I suppose it's theft, isn't it? Let's uh, take the best bits of But different. Everything people is theft. You'd learn to tie your shoes. You didn't invent it. <laughs> you know? Well, that's true. That's true. Although I did ring more Nikasik and said, I really like the bass line you did in uh, in the game, your Fiona. Uh, I, said, I think I might nick that. I said, and she, she wasn't too impressed. <laughs> with, so I left it alone. I didn't touch it after that. I was kind of hoping to say, great, you used it away, far away. But she didn't. I near a vein, Kadig. I got So, uh, but I listened to different people's versions, studied the manuscript, yeah. and I found what I thought. I tried to get inside what I thought the Harpers would, how they would feel it. Because sometimes I just disagreed with some of the manuscripts. I, I, it reaches a certain point in the line, and it tells you to go somewhere else, and I would say, no, no, they would mm. not have mm -hmm. gone. Uh, they would have waited, they would have rested there for a minute, and then before they moved on. So the, you have to take certain decisions. That's your own interpretation, anyway. So uh, we play uh, yeah. Sheila Conlon, or written as Celia Canellan sometimes. Will off I, you will I, will I oh, yeah. start it off, Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Two funny things there, you know, the 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 way I'm used to playing it and where the where the emphasis is, and then the other thing is that when I'm playing with the with the girls, I play. I don't repeat the part, mm. so when we've done one half of it, I'm ready to go into the next half, but we're doing the same half again. It's amazing how your brain just melts. But uh, uh, one thing I think is amazing, those tunes, they're, they're quite lengthy. Yeah. I mean, people there, I mean, there's one tune, Shawk Naherna by Ruri Dalakan. I mean, the first part alone is probably a minute, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, just for the first part. I mean, here we're used to pieces of music that are over in two or three minutes. Two or three minutes. But those boys are only just getting, getting going for, for the first round, which kind of made me think or those people, should I say, uh, that they were able to hold in their skulls large tranches of melody, that we're, uh, we're on this tiny little earworms that we, we so used to, but those 400 years ago, people could hold very long melodies in their heads. That's um, amazing. What they call Western, Western art music is all coming off the page, mm. but our music is coming from our memory and from our heart and from our experience. And we have to remember it, which is wonderful. Yeah, the oral tradition. Yeah, so that relates to how you were talking about reading music because those people, particularly blind harpers, couldn't. Yeah, why couldn't they? <laughs> but there's a great story about... Um, uh, have you read the memoirs of Arthur O'Neill? I've read bits of them. In fact, yeah. I've read bits of them out at concerts. Well, if anyone's interested in the old harp music, you, you should check out on the internet the memoirs of Arthur O'Neill. Yeah. And he was one of the, Edward Bunting's prime informants. He was from Tyrone. Uh, he travelled Ireland, travelling harper. But he had lots of stories because he was the generation after Carolyn. And he was meeting the people that knew Carolyn. And so he has plenty of stories about what went on. And... Um, he tells one story about... This is, they played pranks on each other, like uh, one story about... Um, it's a great Kerry Piper. Uh, Ker Kerry Harper, I'm sorry. Con Cornelius Lyons. Cornelius Lyons. And, uh, from North Kerry. And he was the harper to Lord Antrim. And they were... They loved playing pranks. And Carolyn was there, and they were staying in a big house somewhere in uh, North Connacht. But Carolyn had a particular dislike of a man he called Charlie Bereen, which they think was Charles Byrne, the harpist. Charlie Bereen, Carolyn couldn't bear him at all. Anyway, as part of the, the journey, as part of the visit, Carolyn had played this tune to the Lord of wherever they were staying. 
And Con Lyons was cute enough to write it down because he wasn't, and he wrote down Carolyn's tune on this Tuesday, and they decided to uh, play a prank on Carolyn, and the Lord was in on it. And so, uh, uh, so Con Lyons' servant, they all had a servant, snuck in behind him, right next to him, and the Lord said at the window, by God, look, isn't that Charles Bereen coming off the drive? And uh, Carolyn kind of goes into a, a, a tremulous fit, and he, come in, Charlie, come in, Charlie. Well, have you any music? Oh, I've just, this tune I've just written, Your Honour. And, and Con Lyons reads the manuscript and, and plays Carolyn's tune back to him. Carolyn, by if the devil didn't give you that tune last Tuesday. And he gets a stick and starts beating poor Charlie Breen. And they bet him into the nearest town and had him put in stocks, you see. And uh, Carolyn was bit. And then they told Carolyn it was just a joke. And... He took it in good jest, it says. <laughs> but they were the kind of pranks that were playing on each other. Yeah. yeah so At least they're the pranks that are remembered. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that was, uh, that was Sheila uh, Khanloun by... And you have a whole album done of those, which is lovely. Yeah. I was only listening to it this week. Yeah, yeah. well, you see, copy. there's a kind of... A, I don't want to say a p- political, but in terms of guitar players... Strum, strum, like Wolf Tone was there at the uh, at the Harp at 1792. They called. I'm sure people know, but the, the Harpers were kind of a dying breed, so they they had a convention in Belfast in 1792, at which the United Irishmen were part of. And Wolf Tone was there, but he didn't really want to go. He didn't really like the music, and he was drinking a lot. And he wrote in his diary, "I have to go and hear some more Harpers." Strum, strum, and be hanged," he said. <laughs> <laughs> but any, anyway, so uh, strum, strum, and be hanged. So I was thinking, guitar players uh, lumped into the strum, strum, and be hanged category. And so, if I'm teaching workshops to young guitarists, I would say, you cannot allow yourself to be dependent on somebody else to play. In other words, when you come down and, and play on Friday night at the pub, and your only chance to play is accompanying somebody else at the p- a pub session. As you can't allow, for your own self-esteem, you cannot allow, you have to be able to play a tune yourself on the guitar. And the harpers pluck strings and guitar players pluck strings. It's the exact same thing in principle. And uh, so I suppose that was one reason I did the record, just to demonstrate, not that I did it particularly well, but I, to demonstrate the guitar players can play the harp tunes. And we were entitled to play the harp tunes. Because rather than the strum is in the background, I can. Yeah. Uh, that was one reason I did that. You're entitled that. to play them more than the pipers. Exactly, and that was always one of my arguments from the giving out about the guitar. When in Coltus, when I was kind of, I used to give a lecture every year on accompaniment. To, in fair play to Mihola Haloon, he introduced this accompaniment competition, which meant guitar kind of got into Coltus, and Laros, fair play to him, said. The guitar didn't used to be accepted, and now it's accepted, he said. So I was kind of delighted he was big enough to actually say that. But it would become more accepted if guitar players played more tunes, played more, played more melodically rather than strumming away. Yeah. And a lot don't. But, but don't you need to be... I had to use the word, give him permission to, or... Oh, no, but you're uh, right. Does people that, need to say, oh, he's doing that, yeah. well, maybe I could do it too. You need a kind of a permission to be granted, to allow yourself to do. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't until you saw someone going wild on the regulators, you said, oh, I could do that too. I could do that better than him. No. No. I was the first. <laughs> <laughs> but if you... I know this might be a difficult question to answer without sounding egotistical, but... Do you think you, by what you've done since you came to Ireland, have given permission to other guitar players to do more than just strum, pluck and twang? I would think you have. Oh, okay, well, thank you. Uh, the thing I think I did was uh, down in West Kerry, which was kind of an epiphany for me in numbers of ways. Uh, the first was I played at a funeral. When I played at a funeral, and when I got home, there was a, a cabbage, a bottle of Bailey's and a half a dozen eggs or whatever it was. Somebody walked into my kitchen and left provisions for me. And I said, 
this is actually this is the very basic transaction of musician yeah. and community and money had nothing to do with it you provide you fulfill your social function and you will be provided for that was a very deep moment yes. for me uh, if you provide your social function part of the function there is play for set dancers accompany the go to the play for the funerals and the weddings and play for the dancers and that's your social function and if you fulfill that uh, we'll look after you I, I thought that was a tr terrific transactional thing a community kind of social mm. interaction but uh, I didn't have enough money for a guitar, but I borrowed one from uh, Shems and Josephine Begley's sister. Moira had a, a guitar, a nylon string guitar, which I was playing down there. And uh, I was just playing the set dancing rhythms, like for the polka. Uh, like, say, if you're dancing a polka set, you listen to the floor, what is coming off the floor, and what's coming off the floor is if the house that is uh, not for every part, you know, ladies' chain is going to be something mm. different, uh, but that is the basic groove, and it's quite it's very sophisticated. In fact, if you broke it down, it would to its essence is one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, four. And why the last beat is delayed is because you have to stop because you've got to turn to get your next partner. So they have to have that gap. But um, so I was kind of learning that from my years playing down there, learning that style or developing that style. And you incorporate. You incorporate that into the rhythm. You incorporate those rhythms into the harmonic structure of the tune. Mm. So in terms of what I contributed, uh, that was the first main thing I did, I think, was to develop a, a style of playing in carry that, for set dancing. And, uh, and as I said... Um, one epiphany moment was a uh, moment of epiphany was playing for a set and a neighbor Dear McCarney spinning around Tarring a bastard! You know, you know, you're not playing hard enough. You know, yes, Tarring yes. is like the boatman if somebody wasn't yes. rowing yeah. hard enough. Pull, you bastard. <laughs> and so that was fantastic. Okay, bang. And it, you could just you let it go and put energy into it. I found that fantastic. But having said that, uh, it's, uh, what's the word, it's not dichotomy, but you have this highly energised music. And then with the Shano songs, like the way Josephine or Seamus would sing, or, or Brown Dawn. They're the opposite. This tragic, the, the tragedy of those songs like Don Log and stuff like that. Immense space and time. And... Uh, I mean, one thing, Ronan, I cannot bear is mediocrity. And it's like you hear certain songs, <coughs> big songs, and they're done with a bit of boom, chick, chick, boom, chick, chick. And it's just kind of media. It's not tragic. It's not sad. It's too little no. of the road. And then you hear the tunes played. And it hasn't even got enough life and it hasn't got enough tragedy. It's just mediocre. But what I loved about the music of West Kerry, it's full of life, the dancing, and the songs are just full of depth, tragedy. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's extremes. It was the extremes I fell in love with that. That's I totally weird. went off the subject of your question, but... Hey, I have no idea what the question was, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Well, you were asking about contribution. I think what it contributed was ah, yes, developing yes. a style, and now I go back to Kerry and I see the, the young lads. Actually, not the young lads, but the... Uh, the uh, yeah. There's another generation. Somebody said to me, you're the grandfather generation now. And, um, and, and I saw a lad in uh, Scotland did a thesis on the Kerry style of guitar playing, so was, <laughs> which I was described as the godfather of the style. So. I rest my case, my lord. Yeah, so that was good. Yeah. That's good. Now, it's, you mentioned singing there. Yeah. You have the most beautiful do, no. voice. Oh, God. I never, never sang for years. But yeah. 
Well, I played with Seamus Begley for years, and he had the most wonderful voice. Did you listen? But I yeah. learned um, a lot of songs from Seamus. So he, 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 my favourite of them all was, I suppose, uh, Baruch na Uh It's beautiful. Uh, in fact, I, I used to have this thing around where... Um, for playing with people, I would never play with anyone for more than a year because I'd been involved in too many bands where there were cliques and factions. These two alpha males against those three beta males and this one alpha male supported by two alpha two males. And this, I don't know, have you ever experienced that? Yes. But band cliques, band politics, I, I cannot bear yeah. it. It really gets in the way of... So, so that's why you're a duo person. Well, yeah, because you're kind of serving. You're if you're an accompanist, you're serving, but you know you're kind of indispensable at the same time. Absolutely. But it was more that it wasn't because of the duo. It was just I wouldn't play in it with anybody for more than a year. I always said a year. People would ask me, "Would you play in the group?" I said, "Yeah, I'll play for a year, and that's it," because that is not enough time to jockey for position and yeah. make an alliance with uh, Jake and and talk down to that person because by doing that and supporting Jake I will be elevated I might get my new track on the record it's, which I've just had too many years of observing so I say I wouldn't play with anyone for more than a year and then I, I was playing with Seamus I was listening to him and this tear rolled down my cheek while he was singing a song and nobody had ever got through under my guard before because when you're accompanying you're, you're thinking I... Like, D, A with a C sharp bass, B minor seventh. Y your brain is calculating. You're in a mental calculation process. But he had got whatever it was. I think he had a lot of a pain from his childhood as well. But whatever it came out, not obviously, uh, but at the subtext, the spiritual subtext of what we came across in his voice. And so did your analytical mind then take a holiday during that? Well, and yeah. you were on autopilot. Yeah, you have to kind of, to some degree. But I remember this tear rolling down my cheek. I thought, nobody has ever got under my guard. And then it happened again on another occasion, a tear. I thought, OK, well, and that's when I decided I would commit to playing with it. That's when I gave up my one-year rule after meeting Seamus and playing with him. Um, yeah. I suppose since you're talking about songs, I'll, I'll attempt an old song anyway. Or on, or, which I... I I heard Seamus sing Rina Hina. Oh, 
Killer line in that is so the man. It's an emigration song, I suppose, and he's leaving his lady. But uh, getting the boat to America or Canada, wherever it was, a trow sheer around in your, you know, plowing west on the on the river of tears. I think that's such a an evocative um, line. Yeah. There's such beautiful evocation in the Gaelic songs. Well, come here. As we are at this sort of level, level, would you? We're sort of, I'm I'm gone off in a trance. Would we play Maharali? Maharali, yes, sir, of course. Maharali, yes. Mm. And okay. your do I have to do something? I think I do. Do you have to change to a different machine? Guitar, yes, change. And I think it was it was Mary Claire. It was you that I got this from originally. Yeah. Who who? From Mary Claire Branagh. Oh, yeah. That I heard first singing it. Very good. I 300 th- years ago. I think I first heard Neve Parsons sing it in the onion field. In the onion field. <sighs> A be- What's the story of the song, Ronan? I've no idea. Well, I just well, play music. I'm, I'm buying for time while I have to tune. Uh, and it, what key are you going to play it in? I've no idea. Uh, I know nothing. So I know what instrument I'm going to play it on, if I can see. E whistle. 
Which one is the E? I've got on my notes, it says, check the key. <laughs> yes. How does that feel to you? Uh, I'm confused, I might have to change my tuning. I'm in a G tuning here, see? I have to go to, to drop D. That's another thing that people are very scared of doing, is changing tunings. And I suppose if you've got a good instrument, and that is a beautiful instrument, you can trust yourself to tune it. Some of the changes that you make in notes are huge. They could be as much as a, a fourth or a fifth. Yeah. Well, like when I was doing the harp record, I, d I just I couldn't do what I wanted to do with the normal tuning. It's just because you'd have to hold down a bass note and then you have to be up high playing a melody. I just couldn't do it. So I had to make bass notes that uh, I could just pluck them and it would s and let, let it ring out. Mm. Oh, uh, just almost there uh, one second we all depend on electronic tuners now these days huh? I wish I could we'll have to invent you something for your pipes uh, no, no, no. well as I say they were in tune when I bought them uh. yeah there was a, a local garage man in West Kerry John Joe Dorgan from Lisbon he was, uh, we I used to play with Seamus at the Hillgrove Hotel every Thursday night and uh, set dancing. And John Joe would come, he was, I was tuning up before the gig, and John Joe was used to tune in car engines. Christ, wouldn't you think Steve would have tuned it before he came? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, but tuning, tuning is fascinating. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful thing to watch somebody tuning an instrument. What about the lutes and those big oh, lutes? Yeah. yeah, I can't give out about the pipes. Imagine. What key are you going to play this in, Roy? I have no idea, but this is what it sounds like. <laughs> and afterwards, yeah. a tune that we played yeah. many times, 350 years ago, written ago. <laughs> written by you. Written by me. Why? Yeah. Why? Why? I, I, I used to do film music. I still like... I used to write film music and I still like to do film music. Uh, not that there's much work. But in 1981, 82, I was doing some film music. Right, for small orchestras and stuff like that. And one, there was an Irish expedition to the Andes, the High Altiplano. And they had llamas as pack, anim as pack animals carrying their gear. And so uh, I'm looking at the llamas, and I have to write music for them, travelling along. And I was it's looking not for the llamas themselves, though. Well, I wrote it. I said I was measuring the hoof beats of the llamas, and they were... <coughs> so that was the pulse I took. And then I said, I want something with the simplest ratio of musical. <clears throat> so you took those three notes, which are one, one, two, three, four, five, one, four, five, the, si the simplest musical ratio. So I wrote the tune based on that. And uh, you were playing away on it, as I recall. Yeah. So we'll do that after... Uh, yeah, after my arrival. And, and because, because, sorry, and because it's South America, I... <coughs> there's a, a kind of an Incan kind of groove. An Incan groove, baby. And we might, we might uh, if anyone wants to think of a question that you want to ask Steve. Oh, Ronan. I don't answer questions must be submitted. I'm very evasive. But uh, there is, there's a microphone there because we, we don't hear the questions online if, uh, if you don't use the microphone. So while we're playing this beautiful piece, uh, be thinking if you have anything you want to ask. And I have to cough again. Once you start coughing, you can't stop coughing. Do you want some <coughs> ishka? I'll have some ishka. And I'll try not to inhale it, try to drink it instead. 
So Flower of Maharalio and uh, this one's just called Andes. You go on. Yeah.
Slides and butches. Towards the end, we might just we might just go for some questions if anyone has them, and then we'll we'll play another set of tunes to finish because we are now. What time is it? It's nearly ten o'clock. It's time for little children like all of us to be in bed. So does anyone have any uh, burning issues they want to bring up with Mr. Cooney? Excellent, no questions. Okay. You have a question? I'm blinded, by the way, by the light, so I can't see. No? Yes? No? No. 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 We must have covered... Everything. That's it. Eddie Mackin, we're fine. No faults. Okay. Well, then, we have two sets of tunes to, to lash us off with. We'll just finish with one. Have I'll just try. finish with one, and then if we'll go like home. This, yeah, and if, they, if we was lucky to get an uncle, we'd have one in hand. <laughs> Did you ever hear a hint like that? It depends okay. on the level of applause, though, you see. Yes. Uh, do you ever see people walk back on the stage after the applause has died out? Has died out. There's Have nothing you seen worse. That? I, I've seen it. Yeah. You've seen it. You've yeah. been it. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't no. go on myself, but I've seen other people go on stage after the applause. I'm going to get my encore no matter what. Exactly. So you don't have to clap loudly and give us an encore. But if you do, we have an ace up our sleeve, so we're grand. We can handle it. Don't bait us. So we've no polkas, but we do have slides. We do have some slides to play. Do you want to finish on the slides, yeah? Sure. Yeah. We've and where'd you get these slides? The from, I, I'd love to say directly from Padraig yeah. O'Keefe, but I didn't. Or his star pupil, Dennis Murphy, I'm afraid. Yeah, I got from them from the record, a, the star a, a quarter inch piece of magnetic tape. Yeah. That's where I got it, I'm afraid. But, uh, I suppose you're talking, this is West, Mr. West Kerry here, this is East Kerry, West Clare, West Cork. Yeah, North Cork. West Cork, Guinea Gwilla, where, where Dennis Murphy was, and Patrick O'Keefe. And uh, they had a lovely way of playing, a bit like what you played with in West Kerry. Had such a... In Schlieflucha. Oh, yes. It's, it's not as wild, West Kerry is pure wild. I find yeah, myself. They were a little bit more evolved. <laughs> hi, hi, Josephine. <laughs> yeah. So with this, we'll say goodbye and thank you very much. And thank you to the Seamus Ennis Centre and to everybody who is involved. We have Niall doing the sound and we have Paul and Shane out, out in the OBU unit. OB, what is it called? OBU, massive big 18 wheeler, you know. And, and uh, of course, a special thank you to the Arts Council for, for uh, making this happen. And Rebecca is the reason that you're here who was doing all the advertising. So fair play to Rebecca. And thank you to you because it would have been very sad without you. And thank you to my special guest, Steve Cooney. And your Farachi in Oct, Ronan the Bruin.
Washington. Well, Washington, where are you going now? I got the bottle from the Rhino Soda. Okay. <laughs> I'm just enjoying it too much. So if we leave, are you going to scream for another one? Yeah. Okay. I would just go, go out. Okay, close it up again. Okay. I want you to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll leave, I'll leave, leave that open. Oh. Get away. Fresh air. Fresh. We have got to, yeah, we've got to get away now. We're such a fickle bunch, aren't we? We couldn't. The trap door was down. <sighs> now. Now. Some real, just a real piping set, Ronan, isn't it? So this is actually a fiddling set. The, the first tune is from, again, another person I never met, Mrs. Murphy, who played the fiddle, and I know just about nothing about her, and I know that a few people, Dylan Blacken and a few others, did a, a CD recently of women, women's music, you know, music that came from recordings of, of women. And uh, I think they did some research. But it's lovely. This is the Butcher's March, and it's a, a mad, mad tune, four-part tune. And after it's the Blarney Pilgrim. Okay. They're not faster in the now. Steve, it was an Ronan, thank an you very much pleasure. for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here, travelling across the eastern seaboard. Well, thank you for turning up. It would have been unpleasant without you. <laughs> no, but I have had many happy memories in this establishment over the years. I'll just like pass on regards to Sean McPhillibean, who I haven't seen for uh, many ages. Sean, who set everything up here. Set everything up, yeah. Without Sean McPhillibean, none of us would be here tonight. Thank you, Sean.
Ronan Brown, everybody. Thank you very much. Grimagi V. White.